very glad to bring to you today Lieutenant General Bob Walsh. Uh, General Walsh is a Naval Academy grad, class of 79, who initially went infantry, then transitioned, went to Pensacola, became a Naval Aviator. I'm sorry for the infantry guys, I know there's disappointment hanging in the air. He initially started in F-4s, then transitioned to the F-18 Hornet, commanded at all levels in aviation. He commanded VMFA 115, MAG 31, also was the commanding general of the second MAW forward in Iraq. Most recently, he served as the division director in OPNAV for expeditionary warfare. And we were very happy to see that him transition from that billet and also as our advisor at the Naval Institute Board of Directors for the Marine Corps to Marine Corps Combat Development Command, Commanding General in August. So we're very pleased to have General Walsh here today and our moderator, Mark Kanchin, and uh, we'll just let it go from there. Mark, over to you. Great, well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, we appreciate the introduction, and I won't take any more time, because I think you've uh, heard the opening, and I'll turn it over to General Walsh. Okay, thank you, Mark, uh, and also thanks to uh, General Daly for U.S. Naval Institute and uh, uh, CSIS for putting this on, and I think it's a great teaming, this mirror time, uh, securities dialogue series that we've got. Uh, I think it's just working tremendously, and, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity. You know, I, I remember when I was a uh, colonel working over in aviation plans and programs over at Headquarters Marine Corps, and you know, you've come to DC for the first time and you operate in this environment and you go, God, all these think tanks telling me what to do. I just want to get on with my program and execute. Um, but I tell you, a different perspective that I've got now uh, on the value of what CSIS does uh, and, and think tanks, academia, um, on where we're at today in the military services and certainly within the Marine Corps on where we're trying to head. Because it is a very confusing, complex, dynamic environment that we've got out there today. Uh, and uh, trying to get all the right learning points. I'll talk a little bit about we have a campaign of learning and what that means. The think tanks are a major piece of that uh, campaign of learning in trying to figure out what the future force of the Marine Corps should look like. Uh, and all you have to do is look at the operating environment we have today. It's very complex from the low end all the way to the high end. Uh, so we really value these engagements. Uh, we value your thoughts, what all of you do, and certainly our partnership with industry. I shouldn't uh, pass up on that uh, to be able to get the good ideas out there. Um, I c I'm down at uh, Quantico, is the, uh, the Commanding General Marine Corps Combat Development Command. I'm also the Deputy Commandant for De uh, Combat Development Integration. Down at Quantico, I think we've got a very unique, so if you haven't been down there, uh, I'd love to get you down there and see what we do down there. Uh, of all the services, and I've been doing requirements and resources for a lot of my career, I don't think anybody has the capability what we've got down there all in one location. From uh, concept development, all the way through wargaming, experimentation at our labs. Uh, we've got a whole requirements process, capabilities development there at Combat Development uh, Directorate. Um, we also have our Marine Corps Systems Command down there and our PEO land systems, all located right on the same base. Developing those concepts, requirements, and then from there, uh, we also have our Training and Education Command that falls underneath me also down there. So then taking those concepts, developing capabilities, training to them, and then that feedback loop of educating the force. We all have that down there, that engine of uh, change that we've got down in Quantico. Um, the Commandant came in, uh, General Neller, uh, and the focus areas he's really got, in fact, he's in the process of, uh, we're working a strategy for him um, that, uh, that will tie in very nicely with uh, EF-21, Expedition Force 21, our operating concept. Uh, and the things I think that he kind of has us focused on is uh, no surprises. Uh, naval integration, which is a major piece of what we've got here to talk about today. Um, so that's a major effort his. Um, combined arms maneuver and making sure that we focus not only on the low end, but wants us to focus much more so on the high to the mid end. Uh, and he's given us clear direction on that. Um, innovation after, uh, you know, really 14 years of land combat um, is really to make sure we're finding white space in our schedules to be able to integrate and experiment much more. So some of you that remember the days of where we had Sea Dragon, Hunter Warrior, Urban Warrior, some of those experiments that we had with our experimentation force, 
Those things that we did back in those days really led to a lot of the distributed operations that we conducted in Iraq and Afghanistan. So those kind of innovations that we did with the experimentation force, we're going to be looking to do more of that. Um, digitizing the force and being able to spread information across the battle space, I'll touch on that a little bit more, and also being able to operate in the denied environment. And, uh, and I think we've got some real good things going on in that. Um, and then the leader-to-led re uh, relationships. And what I'm talking about there is empowering our young Marines and our senior leaders to operate in today's high-tech environment. Because I truly believe that's the advantage we have today, and I'll talk about that from an offset strategy kind of standpoint. Um, but the future operating environment we've got today, um, very complex. We've been in this environment for at the lower end, dealing with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, dealing with the Taliban, much lower threat than we're starting to see today with uh, ISIS or ISIL, and certainly some of the operations that you're seeing uh, going on in Ukraine today and what uh, that type of way, the way warfare and the character of war is changing today. Along with you take some of the higher ends of some of the capabilities that uh, both China and Russia are developing and some of those, uh, the operational concepts that we're seeing them develop. So from the high end to the low end, we see a lot of challenge in here. And I think a major challenge in it is the way technology is changing so rapidly and that the gap where we had significant advantage in our weapons systems in the past is closing very rapidly with the technology that's being able to spread information very quickly. And we want to stay on top of that. And I don't look at that as a negative. I look at that as a challenge. And I'm convinced with American industry that we have today and with the young people that we've got that uh, grow up in a free thinking society that embrace technology and know how to think on their feet, that that's one of our operational advantages, the human dimension, and be able to take that, that human dimension and operate in the human domain. You know, and we come from the air, we come from the sea, but eventually we typically end up on the land in that human dimension and we have to operate in there. And we think our young people and our young leaders today, that's the area that they're gonna uh, exceed uh, with, with the capabilities we've got. Um, nested today, I think, is uh, we've got a uh, national military strategy just came out in 2015, cooperative strategy 21, and last year we had uh, launched Expedition Force 21, our own operating concept. Um, so this year we're going to be looking at Expedition Force 21, refresh that, uh, work with the Commandant on that to uh, refresh EF 21. We think it's solid. Uh, but we want to kind of refresh that now that we've got CS 21 out, and I think cooperative strategy uh, for the 21st century, which is our naval, along with the Coast Guard and the Navy uh, and us, is a very good document for us to uh, take that strategy and move things forward. All domain access is a, a, a key piece of that strategy that we've got in uh, CS21, uh, along with power projection and sea control. So that area there is one that we're working very hard with all domain access along with power control, or, uh, power, uh, power projection and, and sea control uh, with the Navy, and I'll touch on uh, some of the things that we're doing with them uh, on that. Um, the, uh, the balance of investments that, uh, between readiness, as I kind of look at bins, of readiness, capability, and capacity. Those are kind of bins that we work within. Um, and I think, you know, we've been working very hard in the readiness area. Uh, through the last 14 years of conflict, working very hard. We've been in an environment, we've been working with a lot of very urgent operational needs, getting things quickly out into the battle space, uh, and we've been very good at that. Um, but we also need to continue to look deep, look to the future force, uh, and try to look at where we're trying to head in the long term with our programs of record and make sure they're all uh, knitted and nested. And so as I look from a future force development as the lead combat developer in Marine Corps, that future force is really looking hard at the capabilities. Uh, and what trades do we need to make to be able to afford, afford the force of the future? So it can't go all into readiness. It can't go all into capacity. You've got to make trades in those bins to be able to free up the right money at the right time and place for that. Um, CS21 talks about um, people, concepts, and capabilities. So I think that's a good way to kind of bend things is as I uh, you know, kind of look at where we're headed with things. Uh, the people piece, I think I did, I touched on it already. I think people are our advantage. Uh, we work very closely with the other services. I think you know, the high tech capabilities that we have um, in the Navy, it's, you know, we always say that the Navy 
uh, mans the platform and we, uh, we equip the man. I don't know if that's true. I think the sailors that are out there that are operating with this very high tech equipment, uh, it's all about these young sailors and stuff operating in that environment and uh, providing them the right capabilities to be able to operate in that high uh, tech environment. Um, but I see, again, that, that area of the human is our advantage. And I just say we've dealt a lot, many of you have dealt with uh, countries around the globe, dealt with a lot of countries that deal with conscript armies and navies. Um, they don't operate the same way we do. They don't think the way they do. These kids don't grow up in the same environment. Uh, you know, I, I look at a situation where I show up at the airport with my daughter and we're stuck on a two, three hour delay and I'm putting quarters into the uh, newspaper machine to get my newspaper out. And she's right away going off to the coffee shop and meeting with three or five of her friends that just happened to be at the airport at the same time and place. So I had a question this morning on a group that I was speaking to is, are, are young people going to be able to operate in this environment? Are they going to be able to handle this technology we're talking about pushing down them, to them in that uh, area? I don't have any question about it. We've got to make sure it's in the right way so it's easy for them to read. It's not proprietary stovepipe systems where they've got six different iPads in their cockpit. It's getting it all fused on the one common operating picture, but I think they'll be able to absolutely be able to do that the way they do today on their uh, devices. So I think the human dimension is a very key area that's our advantage along with American industry. Uh, being able to develop that technology, then leverage it and rapidly keep the pace, the tempo, the operations going up. Uh, as Marines, one of the people that we worship and idolize was John Boyd, Colonel John Boyd from the Air Force. Uh, his OODA loop. Operation, orient to operate, decide, act. You know, that's what we're talking about. If you've got the information and you can operate and decide and act, uh, you're going to make quicker decisions and operate. As a fighter pilot, if I'm out there flying against another aircraft, if I can get inside that guy's OODA loop and think quickly, and I'm thinking like this, and he's thinking like this, the fight's over. So it's the same thing that happens here. The information processing, we can get that information out there, get it displayed quickly. They can make those decisions in distributed operations, cover more battle space, bring more fires rapidly to bear. That's going to be our advantage. On the people side, uh, one of the things I co-chair with the uh, OPNAV N3, N5, Rear, uh, Vice Admiral uh, John Aquilina is the, uh, the Naval Board. So on the people side, the CNO and the Commandant brought that organization together and I think it's been a, a phenomenal people uh, uh, instrument to be able to bring new ideas forward from the fleet, uh, new ideas that are, are coming from think tanks and organizations like this to bring that into the Naval Board uh, and be able to talk about those things, get the Commandant and the CNO guidance, uh, where we're headed, are we heading in the right direction, and then get that information back out to the headquarters and the OPNAV staff, uh, out to the fleet, and get us operating and executing. Um, we've got the CNO and the Commandant coming into our December board, um, and, and in that area we're going to talk about wargaming integration, and the other one we're going to talk about is the uh, uh, concept for littoral operations in the contested environment, which I can touch on. But those are two key things, to get their fingerprints on that so they give us the right guidance together uh, as the two service chiefs to make sure we're heading in the right direction, which is, a, I think, a, a critical piece on that uh, Naval Board. On the concepts piece, um, from a concepts-based requirement system, which drives from us, I talked about the strategy, the Commandant Strategy, Cooperative Strategy 21. The other piece on this is our, our operating concept, Expeditionary Force 21. That's our operating concept, that's how we see things operating. Whether it's distributed operations down to the low level and platoons and company level teams ashore operating, or it's what I just saw out at Dawn Blitz, where you're talking about distributed operations where you've got a, a coalition task force, a U.S. task force, naval task force, and a special purpose MAGTAF operating ashore and being able to share and operate and come together in a large scale operation, that's distributed operations also, which comes from our operating concept. So that operating concept is going to drive us to where we need to go. Uh, one of the things we've, we've worked in this uh, campaign of learning is to develop uh, wh what we call our warfighting challenges. So one of the, is the, the lead combat developer, one of my key things is to try to integrate across the force combat development or force development. Uh, a lot of good things going on all across uh, the Marine Corps, but how do you integrate that all together? That's a real challenge. So what we're working on is a, a campaign of learning with 
where all the things that are going on, whether it's wargaming, experiments, seminars, things that are going on in our educational forums, uh, things that are going in our programs, bringing all that activity, those learning activities, whether they're intellectual or whether they're physical, bringing those together in a campaign of learning based on these warfighting challenges that we have. So an example of that warfighting challenge would be battle space awareness. That's one of the warfighting challenges. So what we're looking for is to cut across a cross-cutting mechanism that cuts across all our functional areas, across the advocates that we have in the Marine Corps, our different functional areas, whether it's aviation, logistics, or ground, to ensure that when we have something like battle space awareness and you're integrating capabilities onto, say, an aircraft with Marines in the back of the MV-22, that that information may be coming off an F-35 via Link-16 onto the V-22, and now it's put onto an iPad on the back of Marines on the back of the V-22, those mission commanders getting ready to get off the back of the MV-22, that how do you stay connected with all the information that's flowing in from the Link-16 onto the iPad, that when he gets off the back, he doesn't all of a sudden disconnect and go, wait a minute, I don't want to leave the MV-22, because that's where my situational awareness is. So those type of things like battle space awareness, cross-cutting across all our warfighting functions is going to answer those challenges of how we're going to do that. So then we can turn it over more on the capabilities and the requirements development that we've got uh, over in the capabilities development directorate. Um, I mentioned the concept for littoral operations in a contested environment. This was one where the CNO and the Commandant got together. We were talking about this at the Naval Board, uh, and they gave us very, very clear direction at the Navy Marine Corps staff talks on uh, where they wanted to head with this. And as if you look at uh, today's environment that we're, we're in, uh, it's not just about amphib operations. Uh, if we focus just on that, that's not in the larger context of the Naval campaign. And we have to nest within that, and I think uh, updating the naval operating concept, looking at that, looking at uh, this concept for littoral ops in a contested environment, is how do we as Marines fit into that? As we get into some of the higher level things that the Navy has to deal with, uh, and dealing much more so in the littoral operations. And when they get into more nearer into the shore on conducting a naval campaign, what are the submarines doing? What's the carrier doing? What's our surface force doing? As you look at distributed operations that my good friend Tom Roden's talking about at Naval Surface Forces out in San Diego, how does that all play into this, into the larger naval campaign, and how do we nest into that? So it's not just about Marines conducting amphibious landings, it's how are Marines playing into uh, the larger naval campaign. You start putting F-35s on big deck amphibs, uh, we've got to have a lot to do to play and have a lot to, to support and engage and, and play in that environment. How do Marines uh, deal with the capabilities we've got with uh, MV-22s, uh, with Ospreys, and be able to support those type of operations that we've got you know, in sea control? And what are the capabilities we bring to that? So I think um, uh, those are kind of some of the things as we develop this operating concept is, is kind of where we're trying to head with that. Um, Talk about offsets and offset strategy. You hear a lot of discussion about that, you know, and where we're headed. I think as, as you listen to what I'm kind of watching is we've got a lot of teams going on with, uh, in, within uh, OSD and where these teams should be heading in an offset strategy. I don't think it's any one silver bullet. I think it's what, uh, you know, Secretary Work said it's not a silver bullet. I think Secretary Carter said that, hey, a lot of times it's your organizational constructs. How do you exercise in that? How do you organize? And what are the operational concepts that you're coming up with? So I think as we're starting to see that, there's more and more in that area. And I think, again, that area of being able to gather information so everything is a sensor, a shooter, and a sharer. And when I say share, we've got a lot of capabilities out there to be able to share information, to be able to spread that, uh, that information out, to be able to make uh, quick uh, solutions. Um, just rapidly on some of, some of the, uh, the programs that we've got, uh, getting into the capability area, amphibious combat vehicle critical piece for the Marines. It's a service defining capability to be able to come from ship to shore. It's who we are. Uh, if we don't have a capability to operate and be able to move from the sea uh, in today in a 21st century manner to be able to use the sea as maneuver space and sovereign platform uh, along with our partners United States Navy then we don't need to exist and that's what our Title 10 requirements are. That's by law who we are and what we need to do. So we have to continue to operate and continue to grow that capability. Um, and I think we're on a good path. You know, we worked on the path at Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle, 
e the ACV, the amphibious combat vehicle, we wanted to go to high water speed. I know we could have gotten to high water speed, but the trade-offs that we would have done when it came to protection and survivability, when 99 point plus at a time we're going to operating on the land, uh, the commandant just wasn't ready to give up on those, uh, you know, those requirements and survivability and uh, protection uh, to get the high water speed. Um, but we're going to keep working that. We, you know, we had a forum last month with Office of Naval Research. We brought in a lot of our industry partners, and we're going to continue over the next 10 years to try to get to a point where we can develop a high water speed capability and make a, a decision on how do we get there. I use it to the analogy of the, uh, the Lightning aircraft. Uh, P-38, back in World War II, uh, Lightning. Think back to what that airplane could do and what it was back then. You've got a snapshot picture of that. Take a look think of today of the Lightning II, the F-35 today, and the capability of what that Lightning has today, and the co complex capability that it's got in comparison to that Lightning I. Take a look at our amphibious vehicles. They're much better. They're, they've gotten better. They're going about the same speed as what we did in World War II, what my dad was doing back in World War II. So if you take a look at those things is, I know we can move forward in that area, we just gotta figure out the right approach. And we're gonna keep after that. As Marines, as innovators, we're gonna keep, keep after that and keep working towards uh, that end state. Um, let's see, on the uh, JLTV, working very closely with the Army on that. Uh, on the Joint Light, Light Tactical Vehicle Program, uh, we need to get our Humvees that are out there operating, we can't operate with MRAPs you know, for the long term. That's not something as a sea service we can continue to operate in that environment. We've got to get something that can operate ashore, can move quickly, our Marines can uh, use that's small enough. And I think the JLTV replacing our, our Humvees, the ones that are going to be right there at the front, front uh, conducting operations under fire and maneuver, that the JLTV and working with the Army very closely with that. Um, our C2 sensors and uh, systems. You know, I was just out at Yuma this week, and I was looking at our, uh, our last week with our ground air task orient radar, uh, along with our common aviation command and control system. And I was looking at that capability. That, that is the system, uh, and it's actually a very good scalable system in the Gator system, um, to be able to take that capability and project a common operating picture into our tactile air command center. Our TAC is our COC on the aviation side. And I sat down with a major in there, with one of our MTACs Marines. These are the guys that kind of get the knowledge up for the commanders to be able to get the display, how to synthesize the data, put the planning teams together, to put the picture up and display it. And the thing I learned about that, it gets back to the technology thing, is the major that was briefing was, so I'm almost uncomfortable in here because the information that we're fusing here on CAC2S is fusing such a good common operating picture that I had to go through a whole planning process to integrate all these things in the past, take a lot of time with a lot of OPTs to pull this together to present that to the commander to make decisions. It's all up there right now. And his challenge right now is, what does he do with the rest of his time? And how does he now operate and become more effective? My challenge now is not to take that and leave it in the TAC and with the ACE, the air combat element. How do I take that information that's there and push that down to the lowest level of a distributed ground force that's operating? That could be on a reconnaissance mission. There could be swarming UAS that are uh, you know, inbound. How do they know it's coming? How does that information get passed to them that it's coming? And then how do they turn it into uh, a ground-based air defense that may be uh, a, a ground vehicle traveling with directed energy weapons that can quickly fuse that and take down those UASs? So that's the type of thing that we've got to be able to do to disseminate that information quickly, and it's got to be done on a device that fuses that for them that they don't have to do themselves. Um, the MV-22, change in our battle space. Uh, it, it's changing what we do. When you look at the operation we did last year with the embassy reinforcement in South Sudan, coming all the way from Europe to do that with MV-22s and uh, KC-130 tankers. Phenomenal capability that we had. Uh, and the vision that leaders in the Marine Corps had many years ago of what tilt rotor would do for us and where it's taken us today, uh, it's allowing us, the Marine Corps, to be relevant in areas we never would be. Our special purpose MAGTAVs, we'd love to have them on ships. We'd love to have more ships. And we're gonna to continue to work on the programs of record we got, and we think we're on a good path with those ships. But those special purpose MAGTAVs, they're good because of the great Marines we have, but we've got Ospreys that can go long distances. And that's what makes us relevant and unique. Um, 
But when I sat down with General Dunford and we talked about the F-35, um, we looked at F-35 in, con uh, in relationship to the MV-22. We got the MV-22 out there. We didn't really have a good concept for how to use the MV-22. So we've got company commanders out there today, uh, squadron commanders that are out there operating distributed, a squadron distributed with Marines from a special purpose MAGTAF over four to six countries and operating over you know, four different missions because we've got the capability. They're figuring out the operational concept on the fly and doing it because they're innovative and they're out there in the fleet. We don't want to do the same thing with the F-35. So one of the things the Naval Board's working on is a concept of employment for the F-35, fifth generation concept, our con ops, and how we're going to do that with our partners with the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine, and our international partners. Because we've got to figure out what fifth generation really means and how we're going to do it. Precision uh, and strike, precision strike and stealth given. But that's not what we're paying for with this airplane. It's the information sensor that can pull in phenomenal amount of information, synthesize that, and push it across the battle space. So whether it's a cruiser shooting an SM-6, or it's a Marine on the ground that's worried, like I said, about UAS is inbound and he's in a, a, a patrol, that's the information we've got to be able to push out there, and the F-35 is going to take us, I think, in the same type of growth that we saw in the uh, MV-22 and give us those capabilities. We just threw the, uh, flew the CH-53 Kilo yesterday for the first time, flew. Uh, that's going to give us a lot of our capability to move. Uh, it's going to almost double, I think, what we have in the CH-53 Echo. So ship-to-shore movement, being able to move things around our battle space, it's going to bring us tremendous uh, capability. Um, and then our ships. Uh, I will tell you, I, I just came from the OPNAV staff where I had the Expeditionary Warfare portfolio. Um, and I will tell you, I don't think there's a, a, I couldn't have been more pleased with the integration that I had with the, uh, the sailors up there on the CNO staff. Uh, the support that we received from CNO staff, and uh, the teamwork we've got on the plan we've got going forward with our, our shipbuilding plan. Uh, and that goes for the LPD-17 class ships, what are operating phenomenally. Technology, we've got C2 on those ships that are probably better than our big deck amphibs in a lot of ways because of the technology we've integrated into those ships. The decision was made on the LXR, or LSD replacement, to go with a, um, uh, LPD-17 San Antonio class hull form. Working that very closely with our industry partners and along with the acquisition side, uh, with the cost caps that we've got, and we're gonna get a ship that looks very much like an LPD-17. A lot of commonality for the sailors and Marines that are gonna operate that ship. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of commonality with training with the LPD-17 class. It's gonna bring us tremendous capability that we wouldn't have had before if we just replaced our LSDs in a one-for-one -one replacement. The big deck amphibs with America and Tripoli coming online, those LHAs, and then LHA-8 right behind that um, is gonna bring us again, putting F-35s on that and becoming much bigger players in the larger uh, maritime um, environment when it comes to power projection, sea control, supporting the naval campaign, and not just uh, focused on just supporting cast to ground troops and how we play in that uh, environment. Um, some of the expeditionary ships like we've got, like the expeditionary uh, fast transport in our joint high-speed vessel, the expeditionary transport dock, former M MLP, and the expeditionary uh, mobile base, the uh, uh, ESB. Using those ships in new ways is what the Commandant and CNO have us focused on. We don't have enough ships. Using those ships in new ways, how we can operate differently in phase zero, phase one operations to get more presence, to be able to operate from the sea is a uh, clear focus. Replacing our LCACs and LCUs. Good plans, good programming, good funding in those programs, and I think that's going to allow us to continue to operate um, in, in a lot of new ways in there. So in closing, I think we've got a lot of good things going on, uh, and I, again, I value these engagement sessions uh, because this isn't a clear sight picture. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on from the low end to the high end, staying engaged with all of you to try to help shape, and trust me, we're reading, we're listening, uh, and trying to figure out where the right way forward is. So again, I, I appreciate uh, CIS, CSIS for bringing us in here today, and along with uh, uh, Naval Institute to be able to have these forums. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, that was a great overview of all the many things that the Marine Corps and McSiddick are uh, working on. Uh, let me ask a, a couple of questions. One is to probe a little about the future force. Uh, periodically, the Marine Corps will do one of these force structure reviews 
and you know, trying to look ahead to structure the force for the future. I mean, as you're looking out, where do you think that the Marine Corps needs to build structure, uh, enhance structure, and, and where might the Marine Corps be willing to uh, take some risk in a, in a world where manpower and budgets are uh, constrained? Um, I, you know, Mark, I tell you that's a great question because what, what we, the, the conversation we're having with the commandant is, is you're constantly getting, hey, I need this, and he calls it balancing the checkbook. There's all these requirements that, hey, I need 147 Marines over here or 38 Marines over there. So what we're doing is we, we've racked and stacked all those requirements. And, okay, we're just going to set them aside, but we're going to figure out where we're trying to go. So the campaign of learning that we're going to do, you know, like I said, over the next, uh, you know, through next summer, uh, to develop what that force structure should look like. But we have to be able to look at this future force to go, we know that in the information warfare area, cyber, uh, space, leveraging space capabilities, um, ambiguous warfare, psyops, that area there that you're seeing a lot of proliferation in, we know we've got to invest in that area, but where does it come from? So I think the key thing that the Commandant's got is we've got us looking at it is he's kind of given us direction um, to take risk and capacity to be able to ensure that we grow the capability where we need to do. So those trades, taking a look at that, that an infantry battalion may look a little bit smaller mm -hmm. in some ways, but you may add more cyber information war warfare capability. So that's definitely an area that we're, we're looking at, but I think in the larger construct is to try to figure out what do we want to look like. So when you take a look at, a, at the operating concept EF-21, and then go, now how are we going to operate? It's not all about small little company level landing teams being able to distribute. It's much larger than that and how's the, uh, the battle force going to operate and make sure our C2 systems that the Marines have are communicating with the ships that we've got out there, which is a real challenge for us. So I know that's not a real clean answer, but that's what I say is, is what we're looking to do is rather than race to answer all these small um, demands that we've got to increase structure in a stovepipe fashion, we're going to try to integrate that and try to make those signals on where the investment areas need to go. Mm -hmm. On a different subject, well, maybe related, but um, leveraging your experience in uh, aviation, uh, there's a lot of attention on UAVs or RPVs, depending on your service. Uh, some people say that the current generation of aircraft is the last manned generation that we'll see, that after that it'll be all unmanned. Uh, the Marine Corps, of course, is bringing on you know, the uh, F-35, which will bring a lot of capabilities. But as you look ahead, both to complement the F-35 and then maybe beyond that, how do you see the manned, unmanned uh, balance playing out? I think it's definitely going to be a, a teamed approach. Uh, I think you're going to use both in different ways than we've been using in the past. So certainly the ability to net and pass information between them, but there's, there's missions that we see that are clearly UAS long dwell, persistence type mis missions that maybe that man in the loop doesn't need to be there or he's that man in the loop, she's on the ground doing it. Um, and then being able to team with capabilities like we've got in the air, like the F-35, or on the ground uh, with our ground maneuver forces, being able to connect those t together. I think the challenge that we've got with the, uh, the UAV uh, area is it's a lot like the technology growth. UAVs are technology, and you watch how quickly they're proliferating and how fast they're moving, that we've got to continue to move fast with them. But as we move fast, they've got to be integrated into the mesh network capabilities that we have. So they're not an, you know, an individual system talking to a system on the ground. It's got to be interconnected with everything we have. But we definitely see the demand from our ground forces is huge. I think at sea it's the same thing. But certainly from our ground forces, uh, more and more demand for certainly the group one, low level UAS is that if you open a popular mechanics magazine and look up a tilt rotor capability in there and what you can go buy this for, uh, phenomenal. But is it protected? Does it need to protect it? If it gets shot down or jammed, can you just throw it away and put another one up? Um, trying to develop those kind of thoughts into those lower level capabilities that can you know, get out there and operate and provide that networked information, just not just eyes, not just EO, 
but signals intelligent, passing information, flowing things that we're getting from, you know, some of the other sensors that are out there, and then moving up to the much higher things. Um, and there's a lot of our Marines that would love to have a Group 5 UAS. Uh, costs a lot of money. Uh, and the key thing that I'm saying is it's got to go on a ship. So if it can't go on a ship, we're not going to look at it. It's got to be tied with what the Navy has, and it's got to be able to operate from the ship. So we're looking at those kind of things and how we can take the, uh, that capability and make it shipboard compatible. And then the other thing I would say is General Davis and I had a meeting uh, uh, on Monday on this, was whatever we get, it's got to be platforms and payloads. It's the truck. What goes into the truck? What payload can you put into the truck? And that's what we're looking for. Open architecture, plug and play, being able to be digitally interconnected with everything we have. So that's the key part on, on the, I think, the, uh, the pieces we go forward is whatever we buy, we're looking to buy a truck that can operate from the ship, have the right endurance, the right range, uh, and then we'll figure out how we get those packages in to be able to give you whatever type of capability that you want. Let me ask one more about uh, something that you re talk a little about, and that's the A2AD environments, of course. There's a lot of attention about that, particularly in this Pacific, although also now with Russia. And, uh, of course, you know, there's a lot of attention on the Baltics, um, you know, where there might be some amphibious uh, requirements. How is the Marine Corps thinking about operating amphibious capabilities in an A2AD environment. And of course, the Marine Corps always makes the point that they're not going to try to do Iwo Jima again. You know, that, mm -hmm. uh, we've done that once, that was enough. Uh, uh, and that it would move where enemy defenses weren't strong. But we're facing now defenses that go out quite a ways. How does the Marine Corps think about operating in that environment? Yeah, I think, I think you have to start with the threat. And what's the threat? Who are you dealing with and what is that threat? And the mission you've been assigned. But you got to start with the threat. So if you're just going in to do a, uh, an HADR mission or a NEO in an uncontested area, well, that's pretty easy. You might be able to pull right into the pier. Or you might be able to come very close in with our LCACs, LCUs, and those kind of capabilities to get close in. As you start looking at the threat, um, are you dealing with a threat that could be a Lebanon NEO where you're looking at uh, um, cruise missile capabilities that could be coming out of a garage or off a rooftop with some pretty sophisticated command and control capabilities that, you know, have been bought at Radio Shack. Um, now you have to deal with that threat. And how, how do we move in close enough and deal with that threat against, and then you start talking about more of a near-peer competitor and how you'd be operating in that scenario. What we really see there is there's some scenarios when amphibious ready group you know, with this Marine Expeditionary uh, Unit embarked on it, can go in and operate very easily. Um, but when you start getting into the threats, and the threats are increasing, you're definitely going to have to rely more on the naval and joint force. So what we're certainly seeing is in this uh, uh, concept for littoral ops in a contested environment, it's actually a great opportunity to bring the Navy Marine Corps team together and how we're going to operate. Uh, and what we're seeing is, what do the cruisers and destroyers do? What do they bring based on whatever threat you may have? Where do you need them? What are the tactics to get you in closer? Is it, is it closer in long-term persistence? Is it just to get in to launch a raid and get back out of the threat environment? So I think from that standpoint, as we develop that, uh, it's, it's certainly naval. It's working with the Navy, dealing with the threat, all the capabilities they bring to bear um, with the capabilities that they have. Um, like I said, from, from submarines and the carrier strike groups. How does that all come together to deal with the threat? Uh, and so what I would say is there are things we're looking at from dealing from long ranges out. I would, I would say they probably are in the area of raid force packages. So we're talking to you here about, you know, Marines coming from long ranges for, out at sea. Those are typically more raid type packages we'd be seeing. Um, when you start talking about trying to do large scale operations, we're looking at maneuver warfare, going where the enemy's not. It's maneuver and fires. And the movement of the ships allow us to maneuver. The fires really come from a lot of the capabilities that we have, maybe organic to the ARG, but certainly with the carriers, with the subs, with the cruisers and destroyers, and how we're operating together as a naval force. So from a sophisticated threat, the threat's gotten better. But I'm also fairly confident, just coming from working on the, uh, the OPNAV staff, that the Navy's been putting a lot of money, a lot of uh, effort. You look at things like Naval Integrated Fires Counter-Air. 
uh, into that. We've got some pretty good capabilities, some pretty good tactics, and it's uh, being able to ensure that we continue to fuse and integrate that into our concept of operations. And I think a lot of it's what's our concepts and how do we bring the capabilities we have together and keep evolving them. So bottom line to me, it, it's, it can't be Marines doing their own thing. It's got to be Marines as part of the Naval Force based on whatever threat you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I have lots of questions that I could ask, but in fairness, I ought to open the floor and let other people ask questions. So, all right, we've got first one up here, and we have microphones coming. <clears throat> Sir, George Nicholson with the Global. Please sit down, George. Uh, yeah. With the Global Soft uh, Foundation, G Lieutenant General Brad Heidholt at AFSOC has been briefing that one of his highest priorities, and he looks at being able to get it by 2020 is a directed energy weapon to put on the AC-130s, all as an offensive weapon, but also as a defensive weapon. In terms of your KC-130J uh, uh, um, packages right now that you've got, uh, uh, what, what, are the, what are you looking at in terms of directed energy weapons? Um, you know, we've been looking a lot at the directed energy from the ground side, counter UAS, so in the, our ground-based air defense. So that's an area we're focused on. Um, saw a lot with what CNO did with the speed to fleet and getting a laser capability, directed energy capability out of the USS Ponce out in Fifth Fleet. Um, bigger ship, generate that energy, generate that power uh, to be able to do that. Trying to get that smaller so we can get it into different places is certainly what we'll be looking at. If you look at the KC-130, and I know uh, General Davis talks about this, is we put the Harvest Hawk capability on there. So again, a C-130, multi-mission payloads and pla platforms. Again, the, you know, the, the, uh, the package is it's a C-130, it can provide gas, it's an air refueler. Now we armed it so it can also provide weapons certainly would be the same thing that we'd be looking at on the directed energy side, uh, that we see that as a growing area where if we could put that type of capability, we'd certainly be interested in looking at that uh, to be able to arming. So one of the key demands that we learned in our last drill we did was persistent weapons. So more time, uh, and so therefore when you come back to the conversation about man versus unmanned, you know, F-35 and its capabilities versus a long duration, long dwell, persistent capability that can bring in uh, directed fires, precision fires down in the right environment. It's not stealthy, it's not gonna be kicking in the door like an F-35 uh, and operate in that environment. But when you finally have the threat to the point where you can have that long, del long duration that we need on the ground over the top of them, then I think that would certainly be the next step up in, in that type of capability, whether it's unmanned or on a KC-130, that would be the type of cable I think we'd be very interested in. Okay, great. Over here. Hi, Jen Judson with Defense News. I'm wondering if you can update us on the ACV downselect one that may happen. I, I understand it's, it's soon, but. Okay, um, I think that decision is gonna be made in November. So I think coming up here very, very soon, we'll have that down select uh, decision from the competitors that we have. I think the plan is to down select down to two competitors, which we each, each get in the EMD phase, would get 16 vehicles, uh, and then they, we would work over the next year to two years to try to figure out which one would be the best so we could have a, a selection of that. Uh, and I think the, what, what I would say about it is, from the ones that we've seen, we're very positive. We made that decision, um, to, to not move in the direction of uh, high water speed a couple years ago in the end of 2014 and go in the direction of ACV 1.1 and into the 1.2. Uh, as you have threshold and objective requirements, what we're seeing is we're very positive about what's going on with the capabilities on and exceeding the threshold with uh, what the competitors are coming up with. And, and my biggest concern was, are we, were we able to get something that keeps us with our service defining capability, being able to get from ship to shore? Uh, and having something that if we're just buying a shore to shore capability, uh, that would limit us a lot in our operations and it would continue to have us to put more and more money into our, our AAVs. Uh, amphibious assault vehicles. We don't want to keep putting money into ALT. We'll do it, um, 
because we have to maintain that service defined capability, but that's not leveraging the technology and where the money needs to go. The money needs to go in ACV. We need to move out in that direction. I think what we're seeing there is there's going to be a lot more opportunity than we probably thought initially when we made that decision with what uh, industry has been able to show us in the ACV area. So I, I think that decision is going to come out uh, in no, November. Uh, I'm certainly not, you know, in on the acquisition side, uh, but I work very closely with uh, Bill Taylor over at PEO Land Systems, had discussions with Secretary Stackley, uh, and we're very confident we're moving in the right direction. We're much, we feel much more at ease on where we're heading with that program now than we were probably two years ago. Okay, in the back. Good morning, sir. Thank you for your comments. Dave Daly from the Carrick Group. Uh, subject is the pivot to the Pacific broadly. Uh, closing in a little bit, the uh, CNMI range plan, especially Tinian and Pegon. Um, I'd like to ask you a, a three questions. The acquisition approach, have you guys identified an acquisition approach there? IDIQ, uh, single award, early contractor uh, involvement. Do you have any idea of a schedule for a draft or an RFP? And do you have any comments on the relationship between MAR4PAC and NAVFAC for that? Thank you, sir. And, and Dave, what were you specifically talking about when, on the, the, the move to out there? What exactly RFP were you talking about? CNMI, the ranges. Oh, out the there. ranges. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank um, you. Yeah, I, I certainly, I've been in the conversations um, and I have not, you know, don't have the details on, on where we are with it. Um, but I will say, I mean, there's no question about that. Moving down to Guam and the DPRI decisions to where we're going to locate throughout the Pacific which is in a more distributed fashion, our Marines and sailors are going to need a place to train. So working very closely out there to try to figure out how we can get the most capability that we can in those ranges uh, as we operate out there. Uh, I think some of the challenges we see is these are not places that we've operated for many, many years. This is new. I mean, now, now on Guam itself, we've got ranges that we have not used in that, in that sense that we're kind of developing our own um, crew serve weapons capability like that on Guam. But some of the other ones that you're talking about, um, uh, trying to, with the, the host government there, trying to work with their developmental plans, I know those are some of the issues that we've got there, is they're trying to develop some of their own capability, commercial capabilities. How do we meld in with that? We, but we definitely see if we're going to move in that direction, um, we are going to have to have training areas, and it can't be up in Korea, can't be up in Okinawa, mainland Japan, and down in Australia. We've got to be able to work in that area if we're going to move a large part of our force structure in the Pacific down into that area. Okay, here in front. Good morning, uh, Scott Massioni with Federal News Radio. Uh, now that Congress has uh, kind of come to a budget deal for the next two years, how does that affect your capability planning because you can look a little further ahead, but also because it's only two years and you can't look too far ahead? Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I guess I, you know, personally, I guess I didn't expect that to happen that way. But there's goodness in it. It gives us some stability, and we've had this before when we've, we've come up with budgets for a year and gives us some stability. So in the goodness of the sense, it'll take us away from that continual resolution environment and not getting new starts started, and we've got a lot of issues with programs like that. So it'll give us some, some um, continuity in that, but it isn't giving us that sense of the long term, here's where we're headed. Uh, and here's how we can develop our long-range strategy and programs uh, like we really need to be doing for that future force. So there's goodness in it. I'm not going to take away from that at all. Uh, I'm very pleased with that. It's going to solve our near-term problems. But the longer-term look, I think we're still looking for uh, Congress to come together in, uh, in new ways to be able to solve these things so we can kind of get back to more traditional, traditional you know, um, you know, program development uh, strategy. Okay, right here. Good morning, General. Otto Kreischer with Sea Power Magazine. One of the things, the problem is you're you know, having, is you want to move back aboard to Navy, Navy ships, you've, you've accumulated a lot more junk, more equipment. Your, your, your systems are bigger, they're heavier. The JLTV is uh, a lot bigger than your, your Hummers and those sort of things, and there's a problem of you know, clearance. You've got to deflate the tires before you can get them on and off. People are concerned that you can't get enough equipment on, and then you can't get it off fast enough. Are you guys looking on your, on your cooperations with the Navy? Are you working that problem of what you can bring on board your gators and how you get them off if you need them? 
We are, Otto. That's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think you, you kind of look at uh, where we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, we kind of walk, walked away in some ways with the, the need to really continue to focus in this area. Some of those skill sets of, uh, you know, being able to be good managers of our gear or equipment, to be able to be shipboard compatible um, when we were dealing with IED threats in both of those countries and MRAPs and that sort of thing. Um, so as we start thinking in that direction, JLTV, you're correct, but it's going to give us the capability of the protection that we would never have had in a, in a uh, Humvee, more along the lines or, or better than an MRAP capability, uh, better firepower. So it's a good vehicle, but that's a fair thing. If you're replacing a Humvee with something bigger, uh, we're moving in the, in the wrong direction that way. Um, but it's with the Army, so there's some of those trades there that would, would uh, what I want to do in almost every case when we can, and General Dollar's given me good guidance, is work very closely with the Army to develop the same type of capabilities when and where we can, and, and to lean more towards doing it wherever we can. So there's some trades as you start working with another service on making sure you get a joint program that like, like that that meets both needs. So that, that would be that trade-off on that. Um, ITVs. You know, um, our small, smaller vehicles that we can get inside uh, our aircraft moving via, via Ospreys or via 53s. Uh, we're working very hard in that area. Some of our op concepts are really driving us to that type of capability so we get more of them onto the ship, more of them ashore via our, our LCUs, LCACs, or via our aircraft. The same thing that turns though is, is you've got to be able to get ashore and then operate in a threat environment. And so those systems that go on there, that's where I think sometimes technology will help us. When we talk about protection systems, uh, as I go into combat into my, with my aircraft, I've got an array of self-defense systems, active and passive systems that are on my aircraft that allow me to go against the threat and penetrate into um, threat areas that I wouldn't go if I didn't have those capabilities. Same thing on our ground vehicles. We've got to move in that direction, and you see a lot of uh, um, movement in that direction. The Israelis have done a lot of that work with their tanks. Um, so I think those are the same things we have to do. Uh, from the connector side and getting those things ashore, uh, we just did a thing out of it was called Operational Reach 15. It was a, uh, a war game that we just uh, completed about three months ago that went right after that problem on how do we get throughput through quicker from what ranges. So we may say we want to operate at longer ranges. You may not be able to get the throughput through. One of the big uh, pieces that we saw with that too is getting fuel ashore. Uh, and there's a lot of fuel on those ships that we could get off those ships in ashore that would allow us to operate in a much more distributed fashion by using our CH-53 threes to move a lot of that. So we're, we're working real hard on that, uh, but I think that is a fair question. We have to continue to focus on how do we get smaller. On the technology side, we're getting more miniature all the time. So things are getting more small and more miniature, and that's reducing a lot of our size. We have to continue to push in the direction of power generation so that the power requirements don't increase. So we're focused on that, but I think that's a fair question on the vehicle that we continue to focus, and we're looking at that on these ITVs. Um, you're right, it's been more on the mortar side, but I think what we're looking at right now, and we're trying to sort through this and figure out where we're headed, but as you start operating in a more distributed fashion, that our, you know, we are a light force. We, you know, if you compare us to an army, we're light infantry. We don't come with all the gear. We come from the sea. We operate aboard ships, which is really your point. So we can't come with a lot of heavy gear, but when our, so we're a foot mobile Marine Corps. When you get ashore and operate, I mean, I think that a lot of those Marines from World War II would recognize very much if you saw our Marines out in the dirt and how they operate. But now being able to get them to move quicker, uh, aviation has moved us a lot in that direction. Our LCACs have us moving very quickly. We have that capability. But when we get ashore, what we're looking to do in that area is getting these ITVs to be more of a logistics capability to bring gear quickly with the, uh, the dismounted forces to, to move and operate in that direction. So I, I think that's what we're looking at, and we're trying to figure out where we need to go with that program. We know we need the capability, and we're going to kind of work through that in the next uh, year or so. 
Okay, in, in the very back row there. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, General, a question for you. Uh, Alex Berger with the Australian Government, Department of Defense. Um, interesting comment about the range, obviously. But secondly, as your, your portfolio covers interoperability, can you comment about your plans to work with allies, both on the logistics supply chain, but also looking at for domestic support when you are on forward operations? On the domestic support, you're talking like HADR type missions? Oh, for logistics support. Or logistics or maintenance or sustainment or capability. Um, that's, that's interesting. I don't, think, I, I don't think I'm familiar yet. I'd, I would have to probably get with uh, General Dana on the installation logistics side. I would say we'd look at uh, any opportunity to reduce cost. So every meeting I'm in today, the, though I said we've got a budget here that's going to be working, we're still on a downward swing a little bit. And so we're trying to figure out always the best way to do that. So partnering U.S. to foreign government uh, corporations and how we do that best so we can comply with the law, do all the right things. But in my mind, cost has to be a driver. Affordability has to be a driver in everything we do. And if it makes sense, that's the direction that we have to push to be able to do that. Because we have to get the most bang for the buck wherever we go. So operating down there with you down in Australia and Darwin, that's a huge investment for your com country to bring us, allow us to come in there and operate with your forces. But also, we've been up in Japan and Korea for many, many years, are very comfortable with the logistics, the infrastructure we've had up there. When you start branching down into other areas, you know, in a lot of ways, we're, as expeditioners we are, it's not come and go on a quick operation. We're talking about stay there and operating together. And I think those are the things that we're just going to have to really kind of work through. Affordability to me, from my perspective, whoever brings the co is to me and sits down with us and says, here's one, here's the other. The first thing I'm going to look at is affordability. And then try to justify how the law can get us to go in the right direction to make it so we get the most bang for the buck. OK, over here. Thank you. Thank you, General uh, Mike Hess, formerly at USAID. You mentioned the HADR. You mentioned the embassy reinforcement. Haven't heard a whole lot of conversation about the capability of the CAGs and integrating that in so that the forces understand and have a better relationship with those civilian interagency counterparts. Could you talk about that a little bit under realizing it's not your primary mission? Yeah. No, that's a real good question, Mike. Um, you know, I think if you look back, We've learned a lot in the last 14 years. So you kind of talk about the CAG approach that we had back in Vietnam. And when we got into Iraq, we had to pull a lot of those old lessons learned out uh, on what we did in that area. But, but it's kind of like um, you know, counterinsurgency operations. We've gotten pretty good at a lot of stuff, and we've got a lot of good lessons learned in that area. I think on the civil affairs side that we are actually have gotten much better in that over time and developed those capabilities. Um, so I th I'm pretty confident that we are doing those things. We are integrating those into any of our ARG-MU, HADR missions that we try to do. But from a skill set side, I just know that uh, that's something that we think about all the time. Uh, it ties in very much with our Marine Corps security uh, and uh, a training group that we have. All those trains, part of our training that we're doing now, more at the lower end, in our integrated training exercises. We train low end. The Commandant wants us to focus much more so on the high to mid. That's his focus. But in the low end, we're doing that all the time with our, our uh, security and training groups in that area. OK, we have time for one more here, uh, right, right there. Thank you, General. George Zamka from uh, Bigelow Aerospace. Um, referencing your comment about, uh, I think it was seer, shooter, sharer. Uh, do you think there's an opportunity for the Marine Corps to uh, avail itself of uh, commercial services, uh, vice uh, acquiring systems to provide that? And an example would be uh, uh, the NGA using uh, satellite data now that's, that's proliferating, that, that is actually outstripping uh, national capabilities in terms of its available uh, availability to advance and take the next step. You, th you think the Marine Corps could, would take a look at some of that? Yes. I definitely do. I, I think from my perspective, you know, as I look at force development, 
I'm trying to move the force quicker in, in every area we can and faster. If it makes sense, we're going to want to move fast in that area. Um, the pressure I'm feeling from the Commandant is why aren't you moving faster in a lot of areas. Uh, and wants that. So, so there's some things I have to go, well, these are big ticket items, programs of record that need to be integrated in the right way. Uh, like I said earlier, we kind of get in this, this urgent uns, Iraq, Afghanistan, get it quickly, get the money, OCO money. It worked, it didn't work, okay, let's just get more and get another program. They don't tie in, we got a bunch of Band-Aids all over the place. So there's a thing, when you start getting into amphibious combat vehicle, joint strike fighter, those things have to be integrated, you know, and you have to make sure that that. But on the, uh, the lower end, we've got to move quicker with technology, and I work all the time with General Schrader on this, Mark Corsiscom, I work with Gen Bill Taylor over there on how can we move quicker in these areas. And when it comes to uh, commercial services and things like that, that's what I talked, you know, General Davis and I were having a conversation like that the other day when we were talking about UASs and where do we head. Is it programs? Is it leasing? Is it how do we get information? The one thing I will say though is, uh, you know, in Iraq, I am very uh, tired of getting dealing with proprietary systems that I buy your system and you can only operate it the way I will let you operate it and it can't share information with anybody. So I'm stuck after doing this for about 10 years now uh, on the battlefield of going, we're not gonna do that anymore. So if you're gonna come in and share, you're gonna share. And it's got to be able to see. But if you can share in a good way and it's going to be cheaper and better than we do, I'm looking at it real quick and going, that might be a better way to go than we are you know, that we have been in the past. Because buying and developing our own programs is very costly too. So I think this is that industry uh, acquisition requirements discussion of if you've got some good ideas and how this can work, we're willing to look at it from an affordability standpoint because it's going to increase the combat capability of our Marines. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately. In wrapping up, I'd like to thank our co-host, the Naval Institute, and also our sponsor, Lockheed Martin, for making this possible. And especially then our guest, General Walsh, thank you so much for coming and taking time out of your day. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.